topic today is imaging and acute ischemic stroke. And my goal is going to be to tell what the evidence is showing because stroke is really, really changing. In this past three or four years, there has been a paradigm shift about how we image stroke and how we are treating stroke and hopefully give some practical pulse. Um, know very well that the stroke imaging and stroke care is very dependent even now, region-wise, globally. So some of the stuff that I'll be talking about, maybe you're not doing it at your centers, but that's the beauty of it is that we can learn from each other when we have that question answer session. So let's start. Um, these are some of my disclosures, pretty much all our uh, grants and funded trials. So what are our learning objectives? So two things. We want to review first the classic imaging features and then the role of multimodal imaging in acute ischemic stroke. My talk is going to be focused on the anterior circulation because the posterior circulation is a whole complete different beast, right? So we'll keep it focused on the anterior circulation. We will also look at some of the current evidence in stroke imaging because that's driving how we do the imaging and how we are going to triage and treat these patients. Let's just see what happened in the stroke world starting from 2015. So if you're not aware, and I'm sure some of you already know this, there were multiple endovascular stroke trials that came in 2015 that basically were in the early window. So it was from zero to six hours when the patient presents with stroke. And what these showed was that the endovascular treatment was a very efficacious treatment and actually had great evidence with multiple trials to show that actually it helped in improving patient outcomes. So in 2015, and I don't, I don't expect to go into details of these trials, but just a, a summary, and this Howard Rowley has shared this trial, uh, this slide with me. Um, the positive endovascular treatment trials, basically, if you look at it, imaging selection was key. The CT, CTA, CTP was not done with, in all the trials. Some of them it had, especially in this extend IA, SWIFT, PRIME, but you can see that the outcome of IV only versus IV plus intraarterial endovascular treatment, clearly everywhere the IA or the EVT actually had much better outcomes. And what that meant was now in 2015, suddenly there was a new treatment paradigm that if you are a CT shop, which most of around the world is a CT based you know, workup for stroke, you do a CT, a CT angiogram triage. If the patient has a large vessel occlusion, IVTPA sure, but then the patient is now eligible for an intra-arterial stent retriever treatment. And the American Heart Association basically in 2015 said, let's do a CT, CTA, it almost becomes like a standard of care for acute stroke patients. Fast forward to three years, 2018, we saw another big evidence from two important trials, Diffuse 3 and Dawn. These trials were done at 6 to 24 hours. Now, what this showed us that up to 24 hours now, endovascular treatment is beneficial and really, really efficacious with high effect sizes, which now meant that suddenly these patients who were you know, kind of sent home that there is nothing that we can do possibly up to 24 hours from patient symptom onset. Now there is a treatment. So again, a very paradigm shifting treatment. In 2018 to 2019, two more trials came up saying that wake up and extend, saying that we can now take IV thrombolysis up to almost nine hours. So why am I telling you all this? When, where does radiology and imaging fit into all this? Let's just see. What was the common factor in all these positive trials? Imaging selection, okay? So proximal arterial occlusion, that means ICA, M1, M2. M2 very small, but ICA and M1 of the middle cerebral artery, they were the main factors. If you have a large vessel occlusion, that was one big thing. Then the small core, and we'll get into this aspect scoring. On the non-contra CT small core, 
Good collaterals, one trial use escape. Like I said, some of these trials used CTP, especially Diffuse 3 and Dawn and Extend, and then the MR selection and wake up trials. So you can see that the common factor was imaging selection. And that's why radiology is in the forefront of these patient selection and triage. So what is the role of imaging in stroke? If the clinician were to ask us, okay, what do I want to know? Here are a few questions, right? Number one is, is there hemorrhage? Then is, what is the location and what is the extent of acute ischemia? The third one is, is there a vessel occlusion? And if so, what is the presence? What is the site of that vessel occlusion? Collateral status, and I'll come to that why collateral is, is important. Then is there salvageable brain or is there already brain dead? Can I go in and open up this artery because there is a large salvageable brain? We cannot forget about is there a stroke mimic? Many times patients come with stroke symptoms, but it's really not a stroke case. You know, it could be a mimic. Again, imaging is both a triage and a treatment selection tool. So let's get started with, and this is gonna be focused on CT based because like I said, even in the US and globally, CT is still the workhorse. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the CT based workup for acute stroke. Let's see what happens in a non-contrast CT. In a non-contrast CT, the fundamentals, right? What are the early CT signs of acute ischemia? So number one is gonna be early hypodensity in the lenticular nucleus in the insular cortex. And there's focal brain swelling and sulcal effacement. And we know this, you're looking for a hyperdense vessel sign, whether it is an ICA or it is MCA. So let's look at this case. So here is a non-contrast CT, and you can see these arrows. Basically, I've got an area of hypoattenuation in this right insular cortex, right? Look at this left insular cortex, still has got here, I'm losing it, it's subtle. Little bit of hypoattenuation over here, and here is a hyperdense MCA. So this is a very classic right MCA stroke. The fact that there is a thrombus over here, you know, you can very clearly see this is like a no-brainer, early acute ischemic stroke. One thing to know, if you're looking at a non-contrast CT, change your window settings. And this is shown you know, very commonly, we understand that. Look at this case. So you've got a 40, 100 when your window settings are not as optimal. And it's very hard to say because even the sulcal effacement is really not set in. I change my window, same patient, and at the narrower window settings, I can see that there is loss of gray-white matter differentiation. Remember, some of these early stroke were, uh, patients, it's really not declared. So anything that you can use with your window settings is gonna be important. In fact, we have almost like a standard soft tissue window over here, and then we have what we call the stroke windows. So look at the non-contrast CT in both. So very important to do that. The hyperdense MCA, we talked about it, right? Sometimes, again, if you're just using your non-contrast CT and you have nothing else, okay, that's your only tool at that point, use that tool really, really well, which means what? Here, it's really hard to pick up a hyperdense MCA. But if I do thin section MIPS, these are easy to do on the scanner, right? So you do a maximum intensity projection. The, you can do it actually on the scanner, no need of any software. Now I can see that the left MCA is actually hyperdense and it's a big clot. So before these trials came out, there was a, um, actually a trial which was looking at this, that if this is greater than eight millimeters clot length, maybe IVTPA will not work. You need to take it to endovascular treatment. Currently, there is no really clot length that pay, we will look for, but just a good tool is to look at your MIPS in your non-contrast CT, and you can do some thin section to look for this hyperdense MCA. Same thing, I think you can have a hyperdense basilar sometimes, hyperdense M2s, but just know that hyperdense MCA is an important sign, but not always that you will see it. What about the extent of ischemia? So there is, it's important, okay, now I know that there is a hyper a hypoattenuation and there is a acute stroke. I wanna see how much of the territory is involved. 
So something easy and objective that can be used is the Alberta score, which is the Alberta stroke program actually had created in Calgary. And this is the aspect score. So if you look at the aspect score, basically you've got 10 points, right? So here, the 10 points are for the entire brain, but one is at the level of the basal ganglia. So you get one point for every area. So this is M1, M2, M3 at the level of the basal ganglia. You have caudate, lentiform nucleus, internal capsule. You get one point for each. And then you have M4, M5, M6. We are looking at the cortex above the level of the basal ganglia. So you have 10 points for a normal brain. And then one point, every point is basically, it's like a negative ordinal scale. So if you see hypoattenuation, you subtract one point. So let's look at this scale. If you have, here is an acute infarct. You can see that there's acute ischemia in the left MCA territory. But if I had to give an aspect score, then I'm going to take internal capsule, lenticular nucleus, insula. You can see hypoattenuation over here. Little bit in the anterior temporal M2. Caudate, remember, can be not only just the head of the caudate, but even the body of the caudate. A little bit of M4, right? You're like almost squinting your eyes and trying to see, but there is a little hypoattenuation. So this becomes an aspect. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six points. I subtracted, this is an aspect of four. What it tells you is that, okay, what is my extent of ischemia? Because remember, a lot of trials used an aspect of six, whether to include or not in their endovascular treatment. Here is another case of aspect scoring. So again, left MCA infarct over here, right? If I've got my hypoattenuation, if I start giving it scores, you've got the lenticular nucleus, you've got the internal capsule, not so good looking. Here is your MCA score. So this is almost an aspect of three. I've got M1, I've got M4, and maybe even some M5 over here, okay? So this is a good aspect score. We put it down on all our acute stroke reports when they come in, just to give a sense of the extent of ischemia, but it's not a perfect score, okay? There are limitations. So important limitations to know, watershed infarcts are really, really difficult to score. If you have extensive periventricular white matter disease, which is expected in these older patients, that's going to be hard. And I think the biggest one is inter and intra-rater reliability is only moderate, okay? So even the experts actually will have a hard time deciding on some, you know, uh, is this really hypodense? Is it not hypodense? If you're interested in training cases, I would highly recommend Calgary has this uh, multiple cases in their, on their website. You can go and get comfortable with aspects, but we know it's not a perfect score. So now what is available is actually automated aspects. And it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's like everybody's using it, but there are some, we all, in the US, there are two uh, softwares that are going to be FDA approved and hopefully in this year. In Europe, they have a CE mark, which actually the software can actually tell you, oh, here it is. It's like, you know, this is my aspect score, eight. So it's almost like man versus machine. You know, do you need a radiologist? And I would say, yes, you do. Now, there was a recent um, uh, article on this, which actually showed that the machines are actually performing better than neuroradiologists. So here is the neuroradiologist scoring a case where they scored the aspects of eight. Here was the automated software, which actually you know, marks it as red and you know, gives it a score. They actually said it's four. This patient did go for endovascular treatment. Tiki score was three. And look, you can see that actually the machine perfect, performed better, but the machines are not always correct. So, you know, we have to remember here is a, what the machine scored as abnormal area and it is clearly an older infarct, right? So the machines are not always correct. So it will be interesting to see as automation and AI comes in, um, how and you know our practice changes. But currently, at least in our center, we are not using these. I just wanted to give you a, a, a preview as to where we are going to go in the future, but we are still doing aspect score you know, human. So radiologists performed aspect scores. Um, moving on. 
So let's go. So we have got a non-contrast CT. We told them whether there is hemorrhage. We told them what is the extent of the ischemia, if there is any hyperdense MCA. Now we've got a CTA. We almost every time will do a CT CTA for every acute stroke. Because remember, now you have a treatment. If there is an endovascular, if there is a clot, the patient can be taken for endovascular treatment. So CTA, the biggest question that is going to be answered is, is there a vessel occlusion? Is there a treatment relevant imaging target, which we call this trait? So let's look at this case. This is a 65 year old right MCA occlusion. Symptom onset was two hours, okay? IVTPA at outside hospital and was transferred to our hospital for endovascular treatment. Um, one thing that I would like to say, the way we are um, set up at the Cincinnati um, Stroke Center, we have a hub and spoke. What does that mean? We have a comprehensive stroke center where endovascular treatment can be performed but then we have close to 20 smaller community hospitals that basically send their patients to us. And so we get a lot of patients transferring to our center as we are building these stroke capabilities. So this patient was transferred to us and you can see there is an older infarct in the right frontal lobe. Now this is not gonna be included in your aspects. So if you look at just the acute aspect score, really there is, it's not a bad looking CT. We didn't see anything acutely on the non-contrast CT. You can see there is a right M1 occlusion over here, a little bit of flow beyond that occlusion. So this would be a great candidate for endovascular treatment, right? So this is the baseline. Here was the right M1 occlusion. This is post-thrombectomy. They actually got a good TIGI score. You can see that the vessel has been opened up. You have got these additional vessels now opening up. This patient actually did well. So what is our CT angiogram telling us? Number one, like I said, occluded artery, right? That's a logical target for an endovascular treatment. Other thing that the CT angiogram tells us is actually looks at the rest of the circulation. Not so much in the acute world, but it is important to actually understand what is the risk for recurrent stroke, right? So obviously CTA tells us about the atherosclerotic disease, the calcified, the non-calcified plaques. It is also very important for the endovascular team, the neurointerventionalist, to understand what is their axis. Are there aneurysms? Is this a really, really tortuous artery? And we can give all that information on the vessels. This is one more that I want you to know about. If you have a CT angiogram, you have to actually think about the collateral circulation because it is an important parameter for acute stroke. So here is one more thing that um, it was very interesting when we first saw this phenomenon, and I wanna share this case. So this is a non-contrast CT done at 1350, okay? Not a bad looking CT, I don't see even, this is those stroke windows, remember we said you really change your windows so that you can accentuate the gray white matter differentiation not bad looking. The non-contrast CT, not bad looking. This is CTA source images. So all that this is, is I'm looking at my source images and there's a complete wipeout of this left MCA, literally a few minutes later. And there is nothing over here. Something to remember, this is a discrepancy between what the non-contrast showed and what the CTA source images is showing. So this, is a CTA source image is like a poor man's perfusion, what I like to call it, okay? What that shows you is that there is brewing ischemia over here, and this patient over here, we actually decided not to treat based on that CTA source image. It is also telling you there is really no collaterals. So you've got collaterals are these tiny vessels or these linear vessels, right, that you can see, leptomeningeal vessels, there is really nothing. And so we decided not to treat these patients and you can see that basically it was, we had to do a hemicraniectomy, this patient didn't do too well. So something in your CTA source images, also look at the aspects over there, you can sometimes get additional information. One thing that I said was collaterals, right? The CTA source images can also give you a lot of collateral information. Why is it important? Who cares? Actually, the collateral flow pattern can determine ischemic tissue survival. So the patients with stroke, 
if you had one patient with stroke, patients with better collaterals are gonna do better, okay? Just the fact that the collaterals are gonna be predicting how these patients have clinical outcomes, whether they have hemorrhagic transformation, there's a host of information that we now know depends on whether the patient has collaterals or not. So let's look at this. What does the AHA guideline say? Do I use the collaterals? It's not being incorporated completely, but it just says it is reasonable to incorporate collateral flow status. But I look at collaterals in every single CTA that I read and I give the, the rest of the stroke team an idea of how the collaterals are doing. Let's look at a few ways you can do a collaterals. Remember, we can do single phase, we can do multi-phase CTA, we can do dynamic. Over here, we are still doing single phase CTAs. And I think that's, again, most of the world just does a single phase, but something to be aware of, multi-phase CTA, if you're interested in doing it, it's actually really, really easy. You can do it on pretty much any scanner. Um, I would say if you're not doing CT perfusion, a multi-phase CTA is a good option. And what we are doing in a multi-phase CTA is basically three phases. One is your early arterial, right? Your you know, number one phase, which is phase one over here. Phase two is early venous and phase three is late venous. Again, this is a great article if you want to incorporate this into um, your uh, workflow. So what it is telling you, this multi-phase CTA, gives a sense of collaterals and the timing. So let's look at this case. You've got a left FM1 occlusion and really a good collaterals. You know, the, although this is occluded, you've got good leptomeningeal collaterals and there is no delay, okay? Multiple phases is just telling you is the vessel, is the collaterals delayed or not? What about intermediate collaterals? Same left M1 kind of an occlusion, different patient. The collaterals are slightly lesser as compared to the right MCA over here, but look at that delay. So all, it's really not like lesser, but it's more delayed collaterals, okay? So this is intermediate collateral. So it's giving you some time resolution of the collateral. And then this is poor collateral. So this patient, right M1 occlusion, complete wipeout, right? Even in the delayed phase, you're not getting anything. So multi-phase CTA, we used to do it when we did not do the CT perfusion. But again, a lot of sites who don't do CT perfusion can do CTA collaterals. It gives them a better sense of the delay piece. Here is an example of another example which when we used to do it. So early arterial phase, here is your M1 occlusion. This patient little bit collaterals, but you can see over here much, much more on this normal side. Arterial venous, you know, you've got some collaterals. This is your phase two. This is delayed venous. So it's not that the collaterals are not there. It's just that it is delayed. And sometimes single phase would have given this a different grading of the collaterals. So the problem of the collaterals is there are multiple collateral systems of how to grade it. And there's really no consensus and no standardization. And that is a problem. So I like to keep things simple. So this is what, if you are grading your collaterals, here are some hopefully useful tips. Number one, you can get thick MIPS at the scanners. You don't need any fancy software. You can actually get like 20 at four MIPS if you're doing a CT angiogram to get it right at the scanner. Some of the packs also actually gives it. Look for three characteristics. What is the extent? We already talked about, right? How much of the MCA is being provided by that collaterals? What is the prominence of the collaterals? And then the delay. What is the rate of the filling if you are doing a multi-phase CTA? But if you have to simplify your grading, pretty much you can have a binary classification. Okay, do I have a moderate or a good collateral versus do I have a poor collateral? And this good versus poor collateral is actually pretty decent because all you need to look at is, do I have greater than 50% arterial circulation filled in? That means I have a good collateral. If not, I'm gonna put it into poor. The only trial that has used collaterals till now is escape. And actually it used good versus poor. So if I'm in a 
acute setting and I want to give them a quick, you know, uh, read as to my collaterals, I basically tell them, okay, this is good collaterals versus this is poor collaterals. Again, if you're using the multi-phase CTA, it'll help you to look for the delay part. Again, if we go into the fancy world of what is happening um, in the automated world, there are some softwares that are now coming out and they're color coding it. You, according to the blood vessel density, you can actually see this. You can see over here, here is an M1 occlusion. And I can tell just looking at it that, okay, there are some, you know, the collaterals are poor, they are intermediate, or they are good. But look at my software is actually telling me what is my blood vessel density. So this patient has much better collaterals, right? Versus this patient has actually poor collaterals, but the software can tell me in color. There is additional software, which is color coding them. Again, I don't think these are being routinely utilized even over here, but as we go along, I think a lot of automation is gonna happen. Um, I didn't include this, but there is also automated large vessel occlusion. We have now softwares telling us whether there is a large vessel occlusion, yes or not, and then the radiologist and the stroke team can go from there. The key, the reason we are doing, there is, it's going into the land of automation is time, right? Time is always, always important. But right now, for at least at our center, we are, we are not using these uh, automated softwares for collaterals. Okay, let's look at a few cases. So 42-year-old, right-sided weakness, comes three hours from symptom onset. If I look at my non-contrast CT, I can see that there is hypoattenuation over here. Aspects is close to eight, not a bad looking CT. This is a vessel occlusion. This patient is eligible for the endovascular treatment. If you look at the collaterals, these are intermediate to moderate. So if I were to split it up, I would call it good. This is decision to treat. Patient was taken to the endovascular suite. Here is a M1 posterior division is occluded. Gets a successful endovascular treatment at four hours. This vessel is opened up, tiki 2 b This is the day two MRI. So, so a good outcome for this patient. What about this one? 45 years old. Now we are seeing more and more younger patients actually. And I'm, I'm curious to see what is your um, demographics. But here is a 45 year old, five hours from last known well, much more bigger area of hypoattenuation, you know, a larger aspect, so aspects of three. Here is a non-contrast, this is a hyperdense ICA, hyperdense MCA. Now, right over here, I know that there's an occlusion of that M1, not too much in terms of collaterals, little bit of distal flow, this is really, if you look at this, this is poor collaterals. This pretty much hypo completely wipe out of that left MCA. So the decision was not to treat, even though this was a younger patient, the infarct is declaring itself. Unfortunately, this patient had an almost wipe out of the ACA and the MCA, had hemorrhagic transformation, had, you know, this patient actually did not make it. Um, what about so CT perfusion? I know that not all people use CT perfusion and you guys might not be using it, but I do want to talk about CT perfusion because a lot of places will start using it, have definitely, we use it a lot over here. And I think globally people are gonna start using CT perfusion. Again, if you have a CT scanner, it is very easy to do CT perfusion even if you don't have automated softwares. So what is the point of doing perfusion imaging? The two big question is, okay, core. I want to know what is irreversibly injured. Nothing can be done. Versus penumbra, which is potentially salvageable drain. So one thing that the CT perfusion and these color maps can tell you, here is CBF map, CBV, which is cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume. Here is a Tmax. You can see over here, it's only a small area of core or which is dead tissue, but a much larger area, which just shows there is hypoperfusion, which means this area is not dead. It is actually salvageable, but it's not yet dead. That is important information to know for the endovascular treating interventionists, okay? So let's look at, here is, I wanna take a step back and just, 
talk for a couple of minutes about pathophysiology. Why is now CT perfusion or for the matter, these late windows, remember we said up to 24 hours, why suddenly it has become like the norm and now we understand this. Let's look at this. This is key. Infarct growth rates are highly variable, okay? I'm gonna give you two examples. Look at this case. This is from Diffuse2, which was one of the trials. This patient showed, this was an M1 occlusion, okay? We know the onset. This was at 11 hours. At 11 hours, this patient shows up. This is a CT perfusion. And all that we have is a small core. This is a, this pink area basically means it is a core. That means it is dead tissue. At 11 hours, somehow the patient has managed to infarct only a small area. So these are slow progressors, okay? As compared to this patient, same M1 occlusion. This patient actually showed up to the hospital at four hours but look at that area of infarction. Already dead tissue, almost the entire left MCA. This is a fast progressor. The difference between those two patients is collaterals. This patient has poor collaterals. This patient has good collaterals. So they are slow progressors and there are fast progressors, which means by imaging, if we can differentiate these patients, that helps the stroke team to treat them, right? That was, the, that was the whole premise of Dawn versus Diffuse 3, which basically has changed how we treat patients. Remember I said up to 24 hours now, endovascular treatment is being, is being offered. Here is a, another case. This patient, 64 year old, came 7.5 hours after stroke onset. This was in just a small, this was a DWI, so this was an MR perfusion, a very small area of infarction, but look at that. If this vessel is not opened up, that's gonna be the infarct, okay? So here it is telling me there is a mismatch. So there is a small core, large area of hypoperfusion, which can be saved. And this patient went for endovascular treatment. This is a huge clot that was removed artery is opened up, right? This is baseline, not much of a flow. Look at that beautiful flow now. It's all opened up and patient actually did well. So this is this paradigm shift you know, treatment that we, are, we can offer now. Here is another case, 81 year old. By the way, now there is also no um, age limits. Even 90 year olds are being treated now. Non-contrast CT, we've got a little bit of insular cortex, which is hypoperfused. Here is your hyperdense MCA, right? If I look at my CTA, I can see clot, like you can see a little bit of flow over here, but there is a big clot sitting there. If I do a CT perfusion, then these are automated softwares, which actually tells me, here is a small area of core, dead tissue, much larger area, this patient, even though it's 17 hours, is perfect for treatment, okay? So this was decided to be treated. This is baseline, opened it up, right? We have got a little bit of clot, but not, not a bad um, outcome in terms of the opening of the vessel. But unfortunately, this patient still infarcted. So obviously not all patients, you know, are going to, going to have this kind of a response that we would like, but this is, again, you, you have to give that treatment to these patients. Here is a 75 year old, 18 hours. Remember, we are pushing these limits now. 75, this actually on the non-contrast CT is actually already showing that there is a large core over here, right? There's a large area of infarct. And over here, poor collaterals, left M1 is occluded, poor collaterals. If we do the CT perfusion, so we are doing CT perfusions for Anybody who shows after six hours, some people do it for pretty much everybody. And this one has a large core, but it is matching with the large area of hypoperfusion. So again, this is a match defect. There is no mismatch. This was decided not to be treated. Area of diffusion restriction, ADC darkness. This was a large infarct. So 
Again, one more example over here showing you the same thing, 89 year old, we are pushing these limits now. Left M1 occlusion, over here I can see a little bit of collaterals, not too many collaterals, but you know, there is a big occlusion over here. I look at my CT perfusion, small core, much larger area that can be saved. This patient gets a, gets a endovascular treatment. Here is the baseline pre-treatment, post-treatment. Look at that. So they pretty much opened up and the NIH stroke scale, which is what previously for this patient was 20, okay? Now patient has only this infarct. So this is a highly efficacious treatment that is now available. And now I think that's why the imaging piece that can actually tell which patient is eligible and which is not is very helpful. Because one thing to remember that endovascular treatment as effective as it is, is not, you know, I mean, there is a overall 10 to 12%. That's what our interventionalists will talk about the complication rates. So they have to be careful about which patients they really want to take to the endovascular treatment. So imaging can really, really help. So what is the guidelines that we are using over here for American Heart Association? So six to 24 hours, pretty much all, like it, according to the guidelines, there is level one evidence, we are using it for everybody. When it comes to less than six hours, it is more controversial. Over here in the US, there is um, varied, it started like we don't need it, but now it was actually corrected this recommendation was delayed, what that was deleted, what it means is it's controversial. So if you ask people around in the US, there are some people who will use CT perfusion for all the strokes. We don't use it for everybody. We'll do it only for six to 24 hours, but I think it is a very useful tool. If you don't have CT perfusion, I would say use that CTA if you're doing that that is a very useful tool and almost like those CTA source images that we talked about that can be like, you know, a, a surrogate for the CT perfusion. Um, one thing that I want to say is now we are pushing the, the thrombolysis, which means IV TPA or IV tenecteplase with these new trials up to nine hours. So it's not just the endovascular treatment. So if a patient is not eligible, or there is, there is no endovascular, say in the rural areas, there is no endovascular treatment available. TPA is being, these two trials, okay, there were two recent trials, EXTEND, which was the most recent, is actually saying that up to 4.5 to 9 hours or wake up stroke, okay, that means that patient just doesn't know what was the timing, they just woke up with a stroke, they are actually saying that you can use perfusion to extend that time window. So it will be interesting in, as we go in the future years, how CTP is not only used for endovascular, but even for IV TPA. Um, here is a big question. A lot of people ask this, which modality, is it CT is better, MR is better, if you have a code stroke, what's the protocol, which is the best? And my answer to that is it's going to depend on multiple factors. Number one is going to be institutional preferences and resources, right? Your resources is going to be different than ours, which means that you have to tailor the imaging according to what is local. But this is important. This we all need to do. It needs to be fast. It needs to be streamlined. And we have to create our own best systems. So here we obviously have the 911 call. In, in your country, it'll be different. But also remember that radiology does play an integral role. We have to work really, really closely with some of the stroke, whatever your stroke team is, to tell them how we are going to do this well because we are the ones who are gonna take care of the CTs and MRs if that's your system. What does it mean, this whole, this, this thing that I've been telling you for the past three or four years from 2015, as the stroke treatment has completely changed? Over here, we are, look, we are seeing a ton of volume. So we are seeing more and more CTAs, CTPs, which means we have to deal with the volumes. And I'll be curious to know if you, uh, if you guys are dealing with uh, some of the increased volumes because of this. 
if you take away nothing from this talk, I would like you to take away one thing. Time is critical, okay? Anything, whether you do a CTA or a CTP, the CT or the MR, any kind of imaging should never delay IVTPA. IVTPA is still a very important, very beneficial treatment. And these collaterals that we said can hold the patient's um, uh, ischemic territory up to 24 hours can fail over time. So if you're ever you know, doing a CTA, CTP, it has to be in parallel. That, so over here, what we do is non-contrast CT is done. If the patient is eligible for IVTPA, the IVTPA is actually started in the scanner. Okay. Many times we will not even wait for the patient to be seen by the ED team, the, the ambulance people, you know, the EMS, the emergency system services, they already know. Patient is wheeled right from the ED into the scanner. So there should be no delay and say you cannot find an IV or you know, you're still deciding whether to do a perfusion, not IV TPA should be started. So that's again, I would highly, highly reiterate time is critical in acute stroke. And so it is very, very important that the radiologists are right in the center of this to create these efficient workflows, okay? Even in the era of the automation, um, I think radiologists have to play a critical role in literally in the middle of as things are happening with the stroke um, treatment and triage. So in conclusion, I know I gave you a lot of stuff like what's happening in the stroke world, but one thing um, is that CT still remains the workhorse. Even in, uh, in the US, majority of the centers still do CT and institutions have to adopt whatever protocols and workflows, but we have to remember that the clock is always, always ticking. So we have to be fast. Thank you very much.